Okay, this experiment was carried out in weeks uh, one to five. Um, the aims were to learn a bit of radio astronomy and some radio pulsar astronomy. So we start with a pulsar. A pulsar is just a neutron star, which is a collapsed remnant of a massive star. Usually, a typical mass is about 1.4 solar masses. Typical radius about 10 kilometers, size of a small city. It's held together by gravity, and uh, it doesn't collapse because of degenerate Fermi gas of neutrons, basically by Fermi pressure. If we use conservation of angular momentum, we can estimate the period of a pulsar, which is about order of milliseconds, 20 or 100 or so, um, as compared to a star, which takes about four weeks to our sun. If we estimate the magnetic flux by scaling down the area, we get about one tesla for the sun, but 10 to the 8 for a pulsar, which is massive, uh, for the neutron star, basically. And uh, the magnetic, the strong magnetic field causes charged particles to be accelerated, that was the magnetic force, and these emit EM radiation, typically in the radio frequencies. And uh, these two poles, uh, energy shoots out of the two poles, basically, as uh, conical beams. And uh, if the rotation axis is not aligned with the magnetic axis, we get the, a lighthouse effect because the beams rotate around. Um, now, for some basic, basic radio astronomy, the antenna is just like a car radio, but the antenna is much larger and directional because we don't want to pick up signals from the ground. Um, it's got a wider bandwidth, about 5 megahertz, which is what we use compared to a few kilohertz for a car radio. And uh, we're only interested in the total power incident on the uh, antenna instead of looking for signals in there, for like AM or FM signals for certain music. We use a diode as a square law detector. Basically, if we stay within the low voltage limit, the voltage from the diode is proportional to the square of the input voltage, and that's obviously is about proportional to the power. We wanted to know, before we did anything important, if the electrical axis was pointed exactly where the geometrical axis of the telescope was. So we scanned the telescope across Cygnus A in azimuth and rotation, and uh, we offset it off, uh, beyond the actual position of Cygnus A on both sides until we had about uh, half of the maximum uh, flux density. So we thought if we take the average, that should be about zero offset. And indeed, we got something very close to zero within our experimental errors. So from then on, the telescope was effectively pointed where we thought it was. Now, the area that the telescope uses is not actually its geometrical area. And that's because from the rim of it, we don't want to get too much signals from there, because we could be picking up signals from the ground, like cars hitting electric fences or cars starting up. So we have low reflectivity on these edges, and uh, the whole dish itself is not perfectly reflecting. So we decided to work out the effective aperture of the telescope. Uh, we scanned across Cassiope A, and we worked out the full width of half maximum. And if we insert it into this equation, because that graph is just a Bessel function, so we know from theory that the diameter of the aperture would be D, which we got to be about 90% only of the 42 feet, which is pretty good because usually it's even less. The, we wanted to measure a absolute flux densities from some sources, but to do that we needed to compare them against something. And uh, we had this calibration diode in the telescope feed, which could sit there and just pretend to be a star to all the instruments after the feed. And therefore, if we knew that cow signal, if we knew the flux density, we could work out everything else. But we did not know cow. So we compared it against Cygnus A, which we do know. And uh, here we get Gal, and that's Cygnus A. By comparing the height, assuming that everything's linear, we can work out the flux density from Gal, which we got to be 784 uh, Jansky. Now we scanned across the crab pulsar, and uh, using the same technique, we have Gal and the crab pulsar on there. We got the crab pulsar's flux density to be about 10, uh, 1008 Jensky, sorry. And comparing that to the ATNF database, I got that mine was 1000, so three orders of the bandwidth was wrong. And that's because my, the telescope was measuring the energy from the crab nebula instead of just the pulsar. 
And the Crab Nebula is excited by all the energy from the magnetic field uh, creating synchrotron radiation in the Crab Nebula. And according to Christian Jordan, the clock's density should be about, is just about right within 2 SD. Uh, next, we decided to run a scan across the sun, and we have the 20 uh, side lobes of the vessel function on there. And the flux density from the sun was 12.1 solar flux unit, which is just 10 to the 4 density. And according to NOAA, the American National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, flux density from the sun at 6 or 6 megahertz in 2000 was 45 solar flux units. So my answer is a factor of 4 volts. And uh, I realized by digging further that the flux density from sun at radio frequencies is proportional to the number of sunspots. And if I could show that the number of sunspots decreased over that time, it would make sense. And indeed, from NASA's predictions, uh, in 2000, we had about 100, 120. And in 2008, we have about 40, which is about factor 4. The other thing we did was study signals from different pulsars that were given to us. And Usually, if it's a really strong pulsar, you get clear signals. But you don't. Usually you get this, which is just a annoying squiggle where you can't see much. However, if you do a Fourier transform on that data, you can see the first the fundamental here, which is the period. It's actually 1 over B, the frequency. is 1 over B of the period of the pulsar. And uh, we get these uh, harmonics because we're talking about the number of pulsars and therefore, the Fourier transform thinks there's also other higher oscillations in there, but of course we do know. For us, we know it's just repeats of the first one. And if we measure those frequencies and plot them against the number, we get a straight line. And using getting the gradient, using one of the gradients, can get the period, which we worked out for five, uh, six different pulsars. Now, the signal to noise ratio is usually very low. So what we do is we try to form the signal. Basically, we slice through the, through the pulsars and stack all the pulsars together for like 100 or so. And if you look at this picture, where I have a, a single pulse, the signal to noise ratio is about 600 to 200, or 100, so about 1 to 5. And if we stack 10 signals together, 10 pulsars, it increases dramatically, and that's because the signal scales as n, the number of pulses we're stacking, and the noise only scales as square root of n, therefore the signal to noise it scales as square root of n as well. Uh, the LOVA telescope was used, used in October 2007 to capture pulses from crab also. Pulses were recorded once every 20 minutes. Now, each day capturing was a form of the signal, but we don't need to worry about that. What we do know is there were pulses at those 20 minute intervals. And uh, if we divide that by a period, by the period of the pulsar, we expect to have an integer number of pulses in between. However, uh, that's just uh, an example of what the pulses look like. We assumed an approximate period, and if we divide the time of arrival for each of these 20 minutes separate pulses, we don't get an integer number. We get an integer with a little bit left over. That's called a residual. And uh, the easiest way to explain residuals I found is this. If you have a signal every 10 milliseconds, and you think it's 9, approximate period, you have 1 here missing, and then 2, 3. So the residual builds up, and vice versa. If you have a period, assumed period is too large, the residual will decrease. It's here you have 9, 8, 7, decreasing. So if your assumed period is exactly equal to the real period, then you would expect no buildup or decreasing, so you'd expect a flat line, a horizontal line. And I assumed a period of 33.682 milliseconds for the crop itself, given by Christine. And uh, when we plot that, we got decreasing residuals, which means our assumed period was too long. So using the gradient of this line, we know that the residual is decreasing by how much over how many seconds. So we worked out that over one second, we're, we're building up more decreasing in this case, two nanoseconds every second. So if we multiply that by the assumed period, we get the amount that the residual changes over the whole period, and that's about how much we're wrong. And the more accurate period then would be, sorry, would be this. And if we plot that, we expect a horizontal line, and of course we did not get that by Murphy's law.